Hi everyone, welcome to lesson seven on composition. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, the way that a shot is composed in terms of the, uh, the actual uh, photograph of the shot. So a lot of what we're talking about today um, in this lesson overlaps with the field of photography. Um, in fact, if you've, if you've studied photography um, even a little bit, you're probably going to recognize some of these concepts. Even if you don't remember the terms, you'll probably, um, these, uh, these ideas will probably uh, be familiar to some extent. Um, so this is the vocabulary for this lesson. A couple things. Uh, I've added a term that was not on the original vocabulary list, and that is blocking. That's a really important term that applies, I think, best to, uh, to composition. Um, and the two terms here that are marked with asterisks are, uh, they're not going to be covered on this video. They're going to be covered on two separate videos that are um, also linked on the weekly agenda. Okay? So, uh, so be sure to, to, to check those out. Okay, so let's talk about our first term here. Um, this term is probably the, um, I, I'd say the most important of all of these because it is, it's kind of the foundation um, for, for, for all of these concepts that we're looking at. And that it's called the rule of thirds. Um, this one is something you probably recognize from photography right away. Um, the rule of thirds is, is not so much a technique that's used within particular shots. It's more of a, a guiding principle. Um, for photographers and cinematographers. So the rule of thirds, according to the rule of thirds, um, is uh, if you're taking a picture or if you're filming a shot, um, you should, uh, you, you, you should, well, let me just back up a little bit. Um, so according to the rule of thirds, a picture um, that's horizontally framed, kind of like your computer screen or a Google slide, um, can be divided into uh, different sections. Okay, so um, we would divide it into three vertical sections. So here, these are thirds, and then three horizontal sections. Okay, and so the rule of thirds holds that um, to take an interesting photograph, a visually pleasing photograph or shot, um, you should place your uh, the the object um, that you uh, you you want people to look at um, and appreciate. You should place it along either one of the the um, vertical lines um, or within one of the uh, far sections here so either like within the far left third or along that um, that that left dividing line or um, the right third uh, or again on that that um, right vertical line um, you might also place it in the top third or the bottom third okay um, but typically, according to the rule of thirds, you don't you don't want to center the object. That that center square and that center column is is uh, is, is not where you should be placing those those um, objects if you if you want to draw attention to them. If you want to have a visually pleasing image, okay. um, these four points uh, on our in our in our rule of thirds are also targets for photographers and cinematographers. So these are kind of places where um, uh, oftentimes a cinematographer will try to place the eyes or the face of a character or um, maybe balance out the face with something else. So here's an example um, from Joker. Okay, so you can see here how uh, the Joker's face is uh, up near our um, top right target area, that intersection here of our, of our vertical and horizontal lines, and his body um, is aligned with that um, that uh, that vertical line here on the right. So this this that is, you know looking at this image using the rule of thirds, we can understand why this is a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool shot. Something else I should point out here because this is a good opportunity to do that is um, oftentimes a good shot or good photograph will have some depth to it. Okay, and that depth is created here by the way the stairs extend. Um, up into the far left distance. Okay, so our eyes, even though our eyes are kind of drawn up here by the color of his outfit and his face, of course, and because he's in, you know, a visually pleasing um, part of the frame, um, our eyes are equally kind of drawn uh, up this staircase 
as well. So there's some good depth in this image. Um, here's a shot from The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Okay, again, so he's lined up on the left. His face is kind of right in the middle of that intersection there of our vertical and horizontal and our upper left. And there's depth to this shot as well created by these, these lines over here. I'll talk more about um, what's happening uh, with this arrangement. This is, this is a, a form of balance. Okay. Um, here's a shot from Sherlock. Um, so he, again, he's lined, aligned on the left. Um, and uh, his, his eyes are, are kind of right up here in our intersection too. So that's, that's a cool shot. Close-ups are um, also uh, tend to follow the rule of thirds. Um, so if you have a close-up, oftentimes um, the eyes are gonna be uh, near these two vertical, uh, or two, these two intersections um, on our, on our, our uh, top third. Um, this is what makes this kind of a cool shot. You've got, of course, James Bond or Daniel Craig's eyes um, in our, near our top line uh, towards the right. Um, but it's also kind of balanced out with the out of focus gun here in the bottom left. Okay, so um, there's this neat kind of um, connections balance uh, between these two um, target areas uh, on, our, on our frame. Okay, the next terms, which apply, uh, come right out of the, the idea of the rule of thirds, would be visual balance and visual weight. And I'll talk about weight first. Um, when, we, when we use a term like weight in, in cinematography, what we're talking about is the amount, the amount of prominence um, that an object has within the frame. So um, essentially, like where, where are, are our eyes drawn when, when we look at the screen, when we look at a photograph, when we look at a shot on a film? Um, what gets our attention? And, and oftentimes, uh, the way that an image, the way that the cinematographer uses the rule of thirds will determine where the weight is. So here, um, you can see that one, I'd say the most weight uh, here is in the face of Mr. Incredible. Okay? Um, that's because it's like dead center on that, uh, on that intersection of our, our top and far right lines. Um, and then the other, uh, the other object that has visual weight would be um, his, the, his daughter's face. Sorry, her, her name, her character name is escaping me at the moment. Um, and, and part of the reason for this is that we were following his eye line too. Okay, when we look at him, we see his eyes looking down at her. So we're going to follow his gaze and look at her. Well, uh, look at her too, just as he is. But um, her face is kind of near this intersection here in our in our um, uh, far left quad or far left. Um, column or portion of the photograph, our left third, let's say. Um, and so that's helping us anchor our, our eyesight as well. So this gets to our next term, which is balance. Um, balance generally uh, can be defined as the harmonious arrangement of the elements in a frame. And to think of that in terms of the rule of thirds, if you've got an object over here on the right third, you can balance it out with something in the left. If you've got an item um, or a, a focal point on the uh, upper right, as we do here with Mr. Incredible, we could balance that out with something in the upper left, um, just as we do here with his daughter. So um, if you're talking about the thirds themselves uh, within this kind of one dimensional frame, um, then we can balance this way. Um, we might balance, if there's something over here, we can balance it over here. Um, so we can balance it directionally, vertically, horizontally, um, diagonally, uh, and so forth. But there are other ways to achieve balance. So I wanna talk about those. Um, balance could also apply to color. So if you've got a very bright color um, that's gaining our attention, we could balance that out with something dark, as we see here in this excellent shot um, from Lawrence of Arabia. Okay? Um, you can see that Lawrence's right eye uh, is right on that intersection here in our, in our, in our frame here, in the rule of thirds. Um, and, uh, and because he is, he's always wearing, um, or at least for much of the film, is always wearing this uh, this white, this white outfit, um, and so he's he's always in contrast uh, to the people that he's traveling with. Okay, um, and this is you know part of the idea of the story is he's kind of this um, you know he's a he, he works for the British Empire, but then um, uh, becomes sort of uh, adopted, um, kind of an honorary member of this Bedouin tribe, and um, then. Uh, uh, 
uh, he ends up kind of leading them um, for, for much of the film. And so uh, he is kind of our hero and he stands out um, from the others. And so his outfit does that. Um, but also just, you know, if you look at the, the brightness in this shot, um, he is clearly the focal point. He's meant to be the focal point here. He's balanced out um, in terms of the rule of three by the, the character here played by Omar Sharif, um, who is kind of positioned in this, uh, this part of the frame. So we're, we're balanced this way diagonally, but also he's balanced out by um, the color. He's wearing the darker color there. Here's another shot from Lawrence of Arabia. Um, and this helps us understand another way that a cinematographer can achieve balance. Um, balance and depth. So we can also balance out what's in the foreground, which means closest to the camera. So here that would be this well and uh, our two characters here. Um, these guys would be in the foreground, okay, with the well. And that well gets a lot of visual weight because of, I mean, it's it's... Um, it's pretty much the only thing um, on the ground in this in this landscape, uh, kind of a very bleak landscape that it almost blends into the to the sky above. So that gets a lot of weight, and so do our characters, um, and they're in the foreground. And you can you can balance out the foreground with the background. And here we have a character riding up in the far distance, um, almost as a mirage at first. And uh, I think he's riding up to kill these guys because they're stealing his his well water. So they're pretty they're pretty focused on him um, right now. But um, we can follow their eye line, uh, which kind of goes along with the line of the horizon, um, and it points right to this character, right smack center um, in in the frame. And so we have a, we have some different kinds of balance here. We have color balance. Okay, uh, we've got the kind of washed out um, tans of the sand, which matches their outfits. Um, and uh, almost kind of blends into the to the, the pale blue of the sky. Um, so very light colors here uh, all throughout the foreground. And then there's this dark spot, this character riding up in the background. Um, and so visually, uh, that that kind of balances out. Um, but then we have we have the balance in the depth. Okay, the foreground images that gain our attention balanced out with the background image. It doesn't have to be a big image in the background to stand out. Um, but we also have balance in terms of the the three sections of vertical sections of our um, of our uh, of our frame here. Okay, we have one character here in the left section. One character over here in the right, and then our background character here, uh, who who's in the center. Okay. We also have, to some extent, um, vertical uh, balance. We've got um, the well, which is has a lot of visual weight, balanced with uh, this character here in the upper um, third. If we're talking about vertical um, balance, so there's all. Th this is one of the one of the reasons why this is a kind of deceptively beautiful shot. It doesn't seem that complex. But if you if you think about the way that this shot achieves balance in, in, in at least three different ways, you can see just what makes it a visually pleasing and visually compelling image. And you can understand why Lawrence of Arabia won Best Cinematography in uh, 1960. Here's another shot from The Incredibles. And you can see here again how we get balance from the foreground. Um, our, our two uh, main characters here at their wedding, um, they're in the foreground. And then we have the priest uh, who is again kind of the middle ground um, between them? Okay, and uh, you can also see that we get um, we get horizontal balance here, Mr. Incredible in the upper right, kind of like he was before with his daughter and his wife here, um, Elastigirl in the uh, lower left. Okay, um, and their eyes, their eye lines are um, connected and they cross over uh, the priest in the center, um, and. Uh, uh, and and the the book that he's reading from here, and so there's this nice kind of flow um, and balance across uh, or diagonally across the frame that way, as well as in terms of the the, the visual planes, the foreground and the middle ground. Okay, the next term would be negative space. Um, so to to think about negative space in relation to the rule of thirds, this is when you've got um, empty and like an empty side of the frame. That's usually and that emptiness is usually balanced out with um, with a, a character on on another portion of the frame. 
Okay, so um, this can be a little bit confusing to understand, but negative space itself can can have visual weight, uh, and and that's oftentimes because um, it it occupies so much of the frame. Okay, so anytime you've got something filling up a large portion of the frame, we're going to be thinking about it and focused on it, even if there's nothing there. Okay, um, and so here's. Uh, here, here's one one way to use negative space. Negative space um, can often uh, be used to to heighten a sense of anticipation. Okay, because here's the thing: um, our eyes and our brains, when we look at an image, we we want balance. And whether that's because film and photography has trained us to expect balance, or that's just kind of the way we we like things is is to see balance. Um, in an image, but regardless, when we look at a, a photograph or we look at a shot in a film, we like balance. Balance makes us feel good. Um, it makes it makes us feel at ease. When we don't have it, it could be a little uneasy, um, depending on the the, the context. Um, and here's an example of that. This is the famous part of the famous shower scene from Psycho. We're not going to watch all of this; just a few seconds of it, get the idea. So here is. Um, We've got uh, uh, Marion Crane, the character of Marion Crane here in the lower right. Okay, so you can imagine our um, uh, our thirds, uh, our our bottom line cutting across this way, kind of on our eyes, and our far right cutting uh, cutting down this way. So her her face and her eye is kind of um, right at that that sweet spot there in the rule of thirds. Now watch what happens in the negative space. Okay, so a door opens behind that that semi-transparent shower curtain, and the, and, a, and a shadow emerges. Okay, and we you you know even if you haven't seen this film, you know how this is going to end. But look where the person's face is in the upper left. Okay, so now we've got we actually have visual balance here because there is something um, in the frame, and that that character comes closer and closer and closer, and the camera dollies in now, and we only get uh, the silhouette. Of the of the killer, okay. So that negative space there, um, you know, it, it kind of sits there and waiting to be filled, as it were. Um, and we and we're waiting for it. We're anticipating it. Okay. Now it doesn't always get filled. Um, sometimes it's uh, it's just there to evoke isolation. We we want it to be filled to achieve balance, um, but it won't be filled. And so in that case, it 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 might speak to a character's isolation their loneliness okay here's a great shot from the movie punch drunk love the character of barry here played by adam sandler um he if you if you think about the way that that the rule of thirds would divide this frame his head is kind of in that sweet spot of the upper the upper left intersection of the vertical um, i'm sorry vertical and the horizontal this way and it would be nice if there was something visually to balance this out over here but all we're left with is the negative space to balance that out so if a character the character is is isolated in one section of the frame, and their only balance is negative space. Well, that might say something about their um, their character, about their uh, about their situation. In this case, Barry's a very lonely person; feels very isolated um, for for part of the film, and so that negative space here um, uh, helps to evoke that. Here is a shot, I think you've seen this before, from No Country for Old Men, um, a great extreme long shot in our main character, uh, Llewellyn, in the bottom left, almost further left than you would want um, in terms of the rule of thirds. Uh, but um, again, uh, our eyes are drawn here, and there's really nothing else, even up here, um, to balance it out except the negative space itself. and so. Um, what we're left with is a sense of this character's uh, uh, kind of staggering um, uh, isolation. And it's not that he's a lonely person, but um, this is an isolating landscape. This is a harsh, unforgiving uh, place, and it's a harsh, unforgiving uh, story uh, that he's in and the circumstances that he's in. Okay, next term, symmetry. 
Uh, you probably know this term from something like geometry. And, um, the basic idea applies here as well. So this is um, this is a really interesting framing technique that can, if overused, can really kind of kill a film, unless you're Wes Anderson or Stanley Kubrick. We'll talk about that in a sec. But at any rate, um, the idea here is that if you were to imagine a, a line drawn right vertically right down the middle, um, separating that that frame into two sides that the left side would almost be a mirror image could almost be a kind of mirror image of the right side okay so that what you see on the left looks almost the same as what you see on the right okay that's that's symmetry okay so it's like balance but um, but but uh, multiplied uh, you know it's beyond balance Now we're going to look at a lot of examples of symmetry in just a sec, but I want to I want to talk about some possible uses. So here's the thing about symmetry: um, symmetry kind of breaks the rules of the rule of thirds. Oftentimes, it will place objects of interest right in the center of the frame, um, and and here's here's I think what happens when when you do that: um, our, the the world the world that we know is not symmetrical. Okay, it's not perfectly symmetrical. There are things in it that are symmetrical, um, but if I were to just take a random photograph somewhere, chances are it's not going to look symmetrical. Okay, so symmetry itself is kind of by definition not realistic. It's not every day. Okay, it's very special. It's very different, um, and it's very artificial. Um, and so you need to you, symmetry actually works best with a story or a mood um, or a scene that is not supposed to be realistic okay um, so case in point here uh, this is a, a shot a symmetrical shot from the film amelie amelie is a french romantic comedy with elements of magical realism in it so we're we're, we're not dealing with a realistic story we're not dealing with um, a drama we're dealing with something very light-hearted and something that does not take itself seriously um, at least at least in many ways okay and yet again you can see how that is already true by looking at the photograph the the paintings on the wall here we've got a dog we've got what looks like um, some kind of some kind of exotic bird pig holding a lamp up um, there's an element of silliness and goofiness and um, kind of you know charm derived from that in this film and so the symmetry here kind of gives us that light-hearted storybook um, aspect contrast that with this this is Blade Runner 2049 Blade Runner 2049 is um, kind of a neo-noir science fiction film very serious um, not a comedy uh, not romantic not light-hearted it's bleak it's dark um, it's a serious film okay now when you put a symmetrical shot in a film like that um, it's no longer part of a light-hearted tone it's a bit unsettling okay um, now here our main character uh, is a kind of a private investigator, I think or a detective, I can't quite remember. Um, and he is, uh, he is uh, walking into um, uh, the building of this company that makes artificial intelligence. They build, um, they're called replicants. And, uh, and this is, it's, it's, you know, it's an unsettling place for him to be in. Um, you know, what, what they're doing here is they're trying to create perfect versions of human beings. Um, and so that idea of trying to perfect humanity, um, is echoed in this kind of perfectly, um, um geometrically perfect, uh, image in this shot, um, which of course, and there's something unsettling about artificial intelligence, something unsettling about, you know, um, you know, is this person a real person? Are they a replicant? Are they are they a robot? And so forth. And so that unease um, is a is is a great thing to communicate through symmetry here. Um, I, I've I've talked about Wes Anderson before. I'm sure I will talk about him again. Um, he's one of my favorite filmmakers, um, modern filmmakers, and he is uh, he's an auteur. He has. Kind of his own signature style um and it's becoming more and more intense with every film that he makes but one of the things one of the one of the um uh, visual elements of his style is symmetry he loves symmetry and for him symmetry uh is used to kind of emphasize that light-hearted storybook 
um, kind of silly uh, uh, mood. Now, his films aren't goofy. They're not necessarily comedies. There is a comic element to them. But, um, you know, in terms of the humanity and the human themes, they're, 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 they're serious, but they don't take themselves seriously. So when you watch a Wes Anderson film, um, you know you're not going to be too depressed. Um, you know you're going to laugh. You're going to think, oh, that's really sweet and cute. Um, but it's not there to scare you or make you, um, make you, uh, uh, you know, feel really somber things. Yeah. Loves the symmetry. Yeah. Now contrast that with somebody like Stanley Kubrick. Okay. He is not, he does not make romantic films. He doesn't make comedies. Uh, he, uh, well, I should say with the exception of one, um, he makes science fiction, he makes horror, he makes drama. Um, this is a great shot from The Shining, famous shot from The Shining. Um, so for Kubrick, <clears throat> Kubrick I think uses symmetry to make us feel unsettled, okay? Takes us out of the real, the real world, the realistic world, the natural world, or naturalistic world, and shows us something that is beyond the real world, almost supernatural, okay? Um, or his science fiction film, 2001, A Space Odyssey, which is uh, a, a very, um, I mean, amazing, beautiful film, but also a very strange film. Um, this is not a realistic science fiction film. Um, this is a, a, a mind-bending trip, as it were. Um, and so part of that mind-bendingness comes through in the, in the symmetry of his shots, like these two. Okay, next term. Lead room, okay? Lead room, um, again, is a uh, uh, kind of like following the rule of thirds. Uh, a lead room would be an indication of a, a photograph or a, a shot that kind of follows convention. Um, lead room is the space between a subject or a character um, and the edge of the frame that they're looking at or walking towards. So if you're if you're shooting a character walking, you know, kind of like a tracking shot, if you're or, or a truck shot, if you're if you're if you're tracking a character who's walking, um, you're going to have them probably in one side of the frame with you know some space there to suggest that he's he's heading towards something, right? He's got enough space to move. Um, or you've got a character here like uh, John. Oops, John Rooney uh, from. Road to Perdition, um, who's looking uh, probably about five or six feet away at uh, the character played by Tom Hanks. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a good amount of space here to the left of the frame um, to give his eyes and give us a sense that he is he is gazing out at, at, at somebody there. It's a, it's a functional um, kind of thing. It doesn't have any like, special significance. Um, except when you break that rule, and I'll show you that in just a sec. Here's lead room from a shot from Fargo. He's talking to a customer across his desk. Um, you know, and you've got the lead room here. You kind of imagine if you want a kind of 3D. Um, there's a, enough space here for his eyes to travel. Okay. Now, what happens when you break that rule? Uh, when you don't give a character lead room? Or let's say you don't have a balanced shot, okay? Um, here is, sorry. Here is, uh, here's an example with sufficient lead room. This is a shot from the King's Speech. But here's another shot from the King's Speech that doesn't have lead room. Look what happens here, okay? Um, we've cut down our lead room on this character uh, probably by 75%. Okay? Um, now, what happens when you do that? Um, you're, you, this is the cinematographer telling us something about the character and their their um, maybe their emotional state. Okay, this character, in in terms of, of his visual spatial arrangement in the frame, he looks he looks pinned, right? He's all the way on the edge of the couch here, um, but he's also he's also pinned in by the edge of the frame. He's he's boxed in. This character feels trapped. He feels like he can't go anywhere. He feels stuck. And he is, in a sense, because he's trapped by his own stutter or stammer. Um, and, uh, and it's something he wants to change about himself. He doesn't feel in control and free, and he doesn't feel powerful. Um, and that is, is conveyed visually 
through um, through this lack of lead room, um, and, uh, and and of course the placement, his placement on the frame. Now imagine imagine this shot, but we move the character over here. So the edge of the couch, the edge of the sofa is here, and he's got the rest of the sofa open and the rest of this space as eye room. Imagine how that would change the tone of that shot. It wouldn't make him feel as confined, right? And that would have a significantly different effect and it would actually clash with the, the tone of the scene. Um, this is a show that loves to use compositional stress and I, I think, um, I think it probably overdoes it, okay? I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but you can see how um, compositional stress here is used in, in this USA show, Mr. Robot. Um, here are two characters having a conversation, looks to be an intense conversation. They're very close together. Um, and so they're, they're, it, it's gotta be a pretty uh, 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 important topic, maybe a secretive one, maybe, maybe a personal one or intense one. Um, but the intensity of that conversation is heightened by the way that these characters are framed, okay? Our, one of our characters here is, um, he is, is back, he's almost backed out of the frame altogether, okay? So talk about a character who feels constrained, who feels pinned down, um, who feels stuck and trapped. This is a character who feels that way, okay? There is nowhere for him to go. The frames, he's, he's backed up against a wall here in the edge of the frame, and this guy is blocking his way here. Um, there's all this negative space here. This is a stressful image because this scene is probably stressful, okay? Again, no lead room for his gaze, okay? Um, not, a, not, a, not a pleasant, not a pleasant um, image uh, to go along with a scene that's probably um, tense as well. Okay, now in any, other, in any other show, I'd say this is probably a pretty bad shot. Um, typically, if you're gonna frame characters walking up and down a hallway, um, you're gonna, you're gonna place them at least in the center um, of that, or you might place them a little higher up to give us a sense of that walk. But what we've got here is almost the opposite. And this is a, this is a kind of a disorienting image. It's almost like it's been turned upside down, okay? Um, we would expect to see this much of the floor and not this much of the ceiling. Okay? So this is, this is a very deliberate move that the cinematographer is doing here. He wants us to feel a little bit disoriented and uneasy, okay? This shot is um, refusing to be uh, uh, pleasant. It's refusing to follow the rules of a visually pleasing image. And when it breaks that rule, it's doing so on purpose to make us feel um, displeased, okay? Here's kind of the opposite here. Uh, we would never expect this kind of perspective um, on a, on a, uh, uh, um, conference table, sorry. Um, we would never expect to see our characters um, push so far to um, the upper left. They're, they're boxed in by the table and by the frame up here. They're almost pushed out of the edge altogether. Um, this suggests a kind of um, feeling of, of, of being trapped, being confined. Um, again, a kind of a visually disturbing and unpleasant image. Um, this breaks another rule that we haven't talked about. Um, that's the rule of headroom. Typically when you frame a character, especially characters talking, you'll give them, you won't give them this much room above their heads. Okay. Um, and this is a strange angle. Oftentimes when you have, when you film two characters talking, um, it will be a little bit more even with both of them. Okay. Um, what, what this is doing, this is forcing a character on the right to be looking down at our, our character here, played by Rami Malek, um, and he's looking up. But the camera could adjust this a little bit, um, maybe not do such a low angle, um, which would help bring uh, uh, Malek's head up just a little bit um, and give him a little less headroom. But um, this, uh, this, this is really pushing him down into the left and giving us a lot of negative space up here which is a weird place to have negative space. So another shot that breaks the rules intentionally. Okay, um, the last term I wanna talk about with you guys on this video is another really important one. This is uh, called deep space composition. Now the term deep space refers here to the, um, the relationship between the foreground. So what's in the front, the very front, kind of think closest to the camera. 
what's in the middle ground, a little further away, and what's in the background, okay? Furthest away from the camera. Um, a shot that uses deep space composition is, um, what it's doing is it's, it's kind of giving us different um, bits of information within almost using a single frame to tell us a story. Okay, um, and so here, here's what I mean by this. In this, in this image, in this shot, we've got two characters in the foreground who are at a well, okay? Um, and what they're doing actually in context, they're stealing water from this well. In the background, we've got this character riding towards them, um, right in the center, okay? Um, and he's riding towards them. And the fact that he's in the center of this shot um, is also telling us something about the power that he has in this scene and uh, in relation to these two guys. This is his well, and he's pretty upset that there are two people who are taking his water. So he's coming at them head on, okay? Not from the side, not trying to sneak up with them. He's coming at them directly. He's not trying to hide, okay? Um, and so that, that idea is all being communicated through what we call deep space composition. It's about the relationship between the foreground, the elements in the foreground, this is information, two guys at a well, and the information in the background, guy writing straight at them, dead center, okay? Um, this may not end well. This is gonna be a moment of conflict, okay? Now, Deep space composition has a lot of different uses, and its uses are going to change depending on the film, on the story, on the scene, on the mood um, of that particular moment, and so forth. Here is deep space, space composition used for laughs. Okay, check this out. Oops, that's not the one. I'm... Here's a scene from Men in Black, the original one. Okay, so first, there, this is actually, there's two, two elements of, two examples of deep space composition here. Here's the first one. Um, Will Smith, uh, who plays kind of a new Men in Black agent, um, he is trying to help this. Uh, they've, they've just, he and his partner have just pulled over a station wagon um, driven by aliens in disguise. And his partner is out talking to the driver, who is the husband. And um, he left his partner here, played by Will Smith, to kind of help the the wife, who is um, about to deliver their child, um, in the back of the car. And of course, he's completely new to the men in black. He's new to this situation and doesn't feel comfortable. Will Smith plays that really well. But in he's in the middle ground here. Um, but in the foreground, uh, we have the, the knees of the expectant mother okay um, and we can hear her kind of off screen um, uh, uh, going through the pains of childbirth here and so he is kind of comically framed by those knees um, we're, we're left to imagine what he's seeing um, but the, the the foreground image here helps give his uh, his expression and his reactions a bit of, of hilarious context Oop, I don't know why that keeps happening okay, so let's watch the rest of this and then I'll pause it again Oh, here it is. Okay, so in the foreground is his partner Kay um, talking to the, the, the husband, the driver. Um, and, uh, and part of the comedy here, of course, is that Kay isn't even paying attention to what's happening in the background, okay? Um, and so, and so the, the foreground here is very serious, uh, and the background here is very, very, um, very, very funny. It's kind of physical slapstick comedy. Um, and the contrast here between what's happening in the foreground and what's happening in the middle ground, I should say, not middle ground, not, not background, um, is that that contrast or that juxtaposition is what's creating the humor of that of that scene? Okay, um, deep space composition can also be used uh, to heighten fear and anxiety. So here's a great shot um, from The Shining. Uh, this is right just before. Um, uh, the character played by Jack Nicholson busts into the room and yells, here's Johnny with his face framed by the, by the broken door. Um, just a moment ago, this was negative space. Um, and then an ax chops through it. So the ax 
it's kind of blurry and out of focus, but it's in the foreground. And um, uh, the character here played by Shelley Duvall, his wife is in the middle ground. Um, and so she she's looking at this thing um, and, uh, and then screaming in terror because of it. So um, it, this the foreground image here gives context um, for her her terrified reaction. Now this this type of shot, any type of shot that uses deep space could be achieved through editing. Um, we could we could just have an image of the axe coming through the door, right? They could shoot a close up of the axe coming through the door and then cut to a shot of of her screaming. And we would understand that there's a connection there, but deep space composition Kind of allows the the filmmakers to communicate that that idea in in a single shot. They don't have to change the camera and um, take it again. Uh, um, so they could just they could communicate this this information and this mood in a single shot. Here is another example of how deep space composition is used to emphasize a mood. This is a scene from Dunkirk. Um, and then watch this. It kind of it happens towards the end of the shot, so I'll pause it and uh, and tell you what's going on here. Here it is. So our character here is in the foreground, ducking and covering, as bombs get increasing increasingly closer. So they start off in the background and quieter. Yeah, he's still in the foreground. It's almost as if we're just waiting for him to die. Okay, that's that's where the tension in the scene comes. He's stuck in the foreground, and the bombs begin in the far background and get closer and closer. Closer. And that's it. And that's it. So, um... So there, the the foreground, uh, the foreground image of the soldier ducking, um, is kind of played in in relation to the um, the bombs in the background, which approach the middle ground, um, and the combination of those two things is what uh, what helps create the the, the tension. Um, for the for the viewers in that scene. Okay, one last one I wanted to share with you here. Um, deep space composition we've seen can be used um, to to enhance the mood or evoke the mood. Maybe that's but that's fear, horror, tension, um, intensity, uh, or even comedy. But it can also be used to advance the plot to tell us to give us an important uh, detail about the plot or the conflict. Okay. Here's a scene. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually give you guys this link. This is a great amateur short film. Um, really, just kind of a cute a cute story. Um, and uh, at this at this point, I'm not gonna give too much away. But um, our our main character here, Brandon, is about to ask uh, Emily, this girl that he's 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 got a crush on and had been kind of pseudo dating. He's about to ask. He wants to ask her to the prom. <clears throat> so he's bringing her some flowers. But then he, as he's as he's walking up to her, he sees her sitting on a bench. As he's walking up to her, um, another guy intervenes, sits next to her, um, and so watch what happens and look for the deep space composition. Okay, did you see it? Let's go back and look at that one more time. Two things happen. Okay, so on the one hand, here we go. Brandon's in the foreground, just barely. So we know that he's looking at Emily and this other guy who is coming up to hit on Emily. Okay, so here, uh, Brandon, as soon as he sees the guy lean in to kiss her, he turns around. Um, doesn't want to see what's happening. Um, so that is one, that's one element of deep space composition, but the, the next one is actually really key because watch what happens in the background. It's hard to see because it's out of focus, but, ah, see, so Emily pushes him out of the way. She hits him. Um, she did not want to be kissed by that guy. Okay. 
So what's important about this is Brandon didn't see that happen. Okay, so there's this 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 miscommunication, this misunderstanding about about this moment that causes some conflict uh, later on, um, right after this in the story. And um, this would be a moment of what's called dramatic irony. We as the audience, we see what happens. We know what happens. But because Brandon is turned around in the foreground, he doesn't see what happens. And so he doesn't have that information. Okay, so that is, that's another uh, use of the deep space composition there. It gives us information about the conflict. Um, uh, in which case, this, in this case, it's information that Brandon himself doesn't have. Yeah. All right, guys, um, I talk more about deep space composition and some of these other terms, as well as terms that we've already learned from past lessons. Um, I talk about some of these terms in uh, the, the two videos that I made for you guys this week. One is a breakdown of some scenes from Citizen Kane. Um, the other one's a, a breakdown of some scenes from um, Road to Perdition. So uh, if you watched Road to Perdition, why don't you watch the video on Road to Perdition? Um, make sure you, uh, 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 well, I, I shouldn't say wait till you're done with this one because you are done with this one if you've made it this far. Um, so watch Road to Perdition if you if you watch that movie, uh, or watch the video I made on Citizen Kane if you watch Citizen Kane. If you've seen both of them, feel free to watch both of them. But um, what I did in those videos was I tried to give you guys a sense of um, how we can use uh, different uh, different terms from all of these lessons um, to look more closely at at how these scenes are working and how um, you know how filmmakers use them. How cinematographers use them when they put these these shots together. So, um, I hope this has been interesting. Um, and again, I'm sorry sorry if these go on so long, but there are a lot of things um, to talk about and a lot of terms to go over. Um, I think next week it, it should get a little lighter and a little a little shorter for these videos. So um, that's it for this lesson, and I uh, hope you guys are doing well. And I'll see you next time.